Sharp, Sortino, and the PRC grid as it relates to debt mutual funds. So let's start with Sharp. Sharp is how well you're performing for every unit of risk that you're taking, and risk here in the in this case is uh, in the form of standardization or volatility. If you go back to the time when you used to help say wealthy clients allocate to say different mutual funds or or different stocks, did you end up using the Sharp ratio or the Sortino ratio? One of the problems with Sharp and Sortino, at least the way that revealed to us, they take daily returns into consideration. Daily is not even a time frame. I want to see my returns. And I think it's just noise. This grid sounds really nice. Is there an equivalent measure for stocks? Either of you? I mean, I wish there were. There is a riskometer. A few weeks ago, I was meeting a friend who was asking me about Capital Mind and how our investments did, and she kept asking me what our Sharp ratio was. Um, and uh, I had to confess, I hadn't been looking at our Sharp ratio in a while, so I I didn't have anything to answer. So I thought we could get into today's episode and look into three small concepts: Sharp, Sortino, and the PRC grid as it relates to debt mutual funds. So let's start with Sharp, and I'll go to Vashisht. So Vashisht, Sharp is a measure of how well you do, and the higher is the better, right? Kind of, yeah. Uh, you can say that. Sharp is um, how well you're performing for every unit of risk that you're taking, and risk here in the in this case is uh, in the form of standard deviation or volatility. So the classic formula would be a return of uh, the instrument you've invested in minus the risk-free rate uh, divided by the volatility. So that would be sharp. Now risk-free rate you can choose to subtract, not subtract, doesn't matter. uh if you're just looking at how much returns you're getting per unit of risk and sortino is very similar in that sense all it does is uh it says look when you are investing you're getting volatility which is both sides right you're getting positive and negative numbers positive returns are good for you in a long portfolio so why should we penalize because the volatility is in the denominator so why should we penalize for uh, positive returns so let's take out all the positive returns look at only negative returns and look at the volatility of only negative returns so that's called downside volatility and or downside deviation and uh, so that's what you use for a denominator so same numerator uh, returns minus risk free rate divided by only downside de- deviation that gives you sortino so sharp sortino both again uh, only comparable in the same category um, like we discussed in a previous episode uh, if you look at a liquid fund a money market fund overnight fund their volatility will be very low the returns will still be decent enough and when you divide that by the volatility you'll get a very high sharp ratio so you may see sharp ratios of 3 4 5 6 or even higher in such kind of uh, categories for equity um, i think anything above 1 would be respectable benchmarks would be less than 1 uh, and uh, good active funds will see more than 1 in terms of sharp and sort you know both uh deepak If you go back to the time when you used to help say wealthy clients allocate to say different mutual funds or or different stocks, did you end up using sharp the sharp ratio or the Sortino ratio? That uh, is a good question. I really didn't look at sharp as much or or meaningfully. One of the problems with sharp and Sortino, at least the way that uh, revealed to us, is uh, they take daily uh, returns into consideration. Daily is not even a time frame. I want to see my returns, and and I want customers to see their returns, and because I think it's just noise. So if you start looking at volatility or now observations that are maybe a month apart or three months apart, that means I look at today's uh, today and then look at the returns three months later from today, the returns three months after that from that time, and so on. Then uh, the sharps appear considerably different. Uh, and therefore, it would actually be more exciting to look at sharps that average themselves over a period of time. And sorty knows more than that because uh, over a longer period of time, you should technically have lower because I may go down two percent one day, then go back up two percent another day. But over a period of three months, I don't have that much of actual downside. So then my sorty knows should actually look even better. This is unfortunately, I mean, therefore, uh, the sharp ratio on a mutual fund is not so relevant. 
but it does make a difference for us with respect to stock. So, for instance, when you're building a momentum kind of a portfolio or something like that, what classifies as a stock that has good momentum versus bad momentum is that even if you give me 10% returns over the last six months, then is that 10% coming on the back of the fact that you are extremely volatile on a daily basis or are you less volatile on a daily basis? If we choose to say that, listen, less volatile is good, give me that 10% return, but don't wiggle around so much because you'll scare the daylights out of me. And therefore, I prefer to say the quality of your momentum is better if your sharp standard deviation is lower. So therefore, the sharp is higher versus the sharp is lower. So if I rank investments in terms of their sharp ratios, I want to choose the highest returns, but I also want to choose the highest returns for relatively low volatility. So the higher sharps are, are, are meaningful. Vashish, does this also mean that if you measure something less frequently, like say you have an AIF that gives you returns quarterly or a PMS that only gives you a monthly NAV or a monthly value, you will automatically have a better sharp issue because there's just fewer measurements? Yeah, think of real estate, for example. If you have bought a house, you are not getting quoted a price on a daily basis. You get quoted maybe once, you know, a neighbor sold a house or once a year and so on. So you get a price only that frequently. So volatility is going to be very less on those prices. Especially if uh, in vehicles like a VC fund or an AIF, in the, well, VC funds are AIFs, or, or a P fund, uh, they can choose, because they choose the marks. They choose how much to value each investment. So if you don't value anything, if you know that, look, this sector is not doing well, uh, and uh, I will not give it a value today, let's wait for six months, and then I will take the value on my books. So you're effectively laundering the volatility in that sense, what Cliff Asnes calls it as volatility laundering. But that's what it is. Like if you don't value something on a regular basis and there's no market to value it, you can choose what the value is supposed to be. And uh, you, and then it it's kind of in your hands. So yeah, volatility will be lower. Okay. Deepak, as I've learned, debt mutual funds aren't just fixed deposit replacements and they don't go up in a straight line. And so to capture that level of risk, um, I think there's a PRC grade. Could you explain that to us? What what does it explain to us? Yes, I think, I mean, so debt, debt instruments in general have multiple kinds of risks. For instance, there may be liquidity risk there where I can have something worth 100, but if I go to the market and try to sell it, somebody is only willing to pay me 98 for it. However, that 100 will become 105 in seven months if I held it. So there's a liquidity risk of my trying to sell it today. So that's one layer of liquidity risk. But these are other, you know, complex risks. But the biggest risks or two risks that a debt mutual fund uh, or a debt instrument has is the fact that unbeknownst or without the control of the debt instrument itself, the interest rates in the market can go up or down. So if the interest rates go up, usually a debt investment falls in price. And the question is, how much does it fall? Sometimes some, something that has uh, five years to mature will actually fall uh, at a higher rate or that means the percentage of fall will be higher than something that's maturing just one month away. So uh, because of that, you have an interest rate dependency that's called interest rate risk, saying how sensitive are you to uh, interest rate uh, changes? And uh, it's measured by something called a Macaulay duration. So it's like, oh, for one unit to one percentage change in interest rate, how much does this particular instrument move? A complex set of factors around it, but that kind of uh, determines the interest rate risk. Um, that is one layer. And the other one, of course, is you invest in a company, it can't pay back your money, that's a default, right? But that's uh, that default is also measurable as credit risk. Unfortunately, we have taken, uh, uh, instead of saying that the debt fund manager can themselves determine what potentially this risk is, they have decided that they will take the opinion of uh, credit rating agencies who have no skin in the game and therefore they keep uh, deciding whatever they want. So, oh, this company is great because, you know, look at this guy's surname. It's a fantastic surname. We should give it AAA. They will allow to believe it's AAA. However, that's my personal grouse. Let's assume that you needed a standard and because uh, just the, because the credit rating like agency like the last name, it doesn't mean that the debt fund manager is also not thinking the same way. Uh, in general, though, I hate the concentration of power in the con concept of a few people who have no skin in the game at all or nothing to lose. However, if you assume that the credit agencies are honest, you know, uh, moralistic people with halos on their heads, then they have given you the right kind of assessment of, oh, this guy will not default for the most part, so it's a triple A. The government is sovereign, fantastic, great risk. Then there's somebody that's double A, that is weak. 
don't think it's the perfect perfect thing but there are chances that it could then they go to triple b which is well it kind of sucks but it's uh, sucks a lot lesser than something that's worse and there's this a you know b and double b and all that stuff so you rate these credit risks uh, into three buckets uh, really good sort of good and mm, and everything else so that's three layers of uh, uh, credit risk the three layers of interest rate risk which i talked about was very unlikely to get hurt by uh, interest rate changes too much so short macaulay durations uh, versus uh, medium versus large so you get three buckets three by three is a matrix so you become a1 a2 a3 b1 b2 b3 and that's the that's the uh, matrix that kind of determines it you want to be a1 uh, but you will probably get the least return on any one this is not none of this is commensurate with return so obviously the safest investment will try to give you the least kind of a return which is why your 15 day fixed deposit because your bank is not going bust in 15 days gives you the lo lowest possible return possible and then if you do one year it's slightly higher and then you do two years it's slightly higher and so on. so the the uh, returns also are commensurate to in this sense this credit uh, classes even in the banking system this the biggest banks which you might think of as the safest uh, offer you the lowest return even on a one year product but you might get much higher returns from a bank that you think is not quite as safe in uh, uh, for the same one year period so as you increase the risk usually the increase in reward is uh, out there but remember when you get your upside is fixed your downside is 100% so i'm guessing if you're at two extremes one would be uh, debt that is corresponding to let's say short term borrowing by the government so you're lending to the government for one week or 30 days and that would be one extreme of this grid um, and the other extreme would be if there were ever a fund that decided that it wants to take the worst companies out there and give them 20 year debt that would be the other extreme so those are the two extremes of your grid in this case right? yes uh, short term government debt on one side long term uh, junk. unsecured junk debt on the uh, other side so there's another fa yeah, factor to a BRI, prc there's another factor to the prc in the sense that while every fund is required to reveal it these can change over time because the underlying instruments I hold could be really short term today, could be long term tomorrow. So there is a transition in this risk. It comes out in the riskometer and in the uh, PRC matrix that is revealed by every debt fund on a regular basis. So just because you bought a fund saying it's A1 doesn't mean it stays A1. So you have to uh, monitor the risk of the of the fund over a period of time. Sorry, but you know, unfortunately, this requires some homework once in a while. This grid sounds really nice. Is there an equivalent measure for stocks? Either of you? I mean, I wish there were. There is a riskometer. Sure, okay. And uh, yeah, okay. there's there's no such standardized measure. But now SEBI requires uh, all AMCs to disclose a lot of these measures, Sharps or Tino, information ratio and things like that. Uh, so those are numbers. In fact, no, you can go on Amphi's website and there is an AV performance link down there. You can click on it and it will give you all these numbers for all the schemes. I want to buy a mutual fund. Where do I go? How do I start? The easiest way is you go to a AMC website, search the mutual fund, you click on invest now. Another options can be you can go to a RTA website. And there are other tools also, like there are online platforms such as MF Utilities, MF Central. Then there are players, online players such as Dhan, Zerodha Coin, Paytm, Covera, IND Money. If you are an old school person, the old method still applies. Does the time of day matter? So how do I know what NAV I'm going to get and uh, what do I have to do to get the right one? So for overnight and liquid fund categories, the money has to come into AMC's bank account before 1.30. For rest of the category, it is 3 p.m. So when I say latest NAV, for liquid and overnight, it would be a previous day. For others, it would be end of the same day. Mutual fund investments are subject to market risks. Read all scheme-related documents carefully.